Hi, uh, my name is Tim Long. I'm an analyst at Barclays covering the IT hardware, communication equipment, and communication infrastructure sectors. Uh, I've covered the space for about 25 years uh, and was in the industry for five years before that. There's certainly been a lot of up and downs over the years, but one of the things that's been constant has been the technology advancements. Uh, we think this will continue in the future when you look at some of these trends around edge compute and 5G and IoT smart cities. AR, VR, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. Um, it's my pleasure today to sit down with three executives at Corning, a company that was pivotal in a lot of these advancements and will certainly be involved as we move forward over the next decade or more. Uh, with that, I'm gonna throw it over to the three executives uh, to give a little bio on themselves and then we'll get into the Q&A and maybe we'll start with you, Jeff. Thanks, Tim. I'm Jeff Evenson, Corning's Chief Strategy Officer. In that role, I have a primary focus on how we create the context and capture the insights necessary to build attractive businesses for Corning around some of these mega trends. My academic background is in physics. Uh, prior to Corning, I was on the sell side covering data networking. I also was a partner at McKinsey, where I helped tech companies capture strategy opportunities. Really excited you're here. I think it's very timely to be talking about mega trends today as people and companies rethink their priorities in the wake of the pandemic and as investors are starting to put an emphasis on thematic investing. Wagi? My name is Wagi Isaac. I joined Corning in 2007. I'm the chief technologist on the West Coast and live in Silicon Valley. I'm an electrical engineer by education and I worked for three companies before I joined Corning. I worked for Hewlett Packard Laboratories, for Agile Technologies, and for Avago Technologies as a Chief Technology Officer, which is now Broadcom. Claudio? Hi, I'm Claudio Mazzali. I'm Vice President of Technology for the Corning Optical Communications uh, Sector. Uh, my academic background is in physics, and I have been with Corning for 21 years, since 1999, and I could not be a better time to be in optical communications right now and with Corning because there are so many so many things happening in the network that's a very exciting time for uh, for this industry and for innovation in this industry. Thanks guys, uh, appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit about the accelerating trends towards digital transformation. Uh, maybe I, I've heard you talk about the kind of the convergence of physical and, and virtual. Yep, uh, digital transformation is a really broad term. The basic idea is there's a move from the traditional analog and manual to a world where things are digital and automated. You know, examples of applications that are pretty advanced on that transition, e-commerce, uh, gaming, social media. Uh, I think of things a little earlier in the transition, maybe payments, fintech in general, learning, uh, healthcare. But across all of them, Corning is playing a built really big role to fuel digital transformation. Uh, think about the proliferation of displays and touch screens that rely on our glass. Think about how fast network connections enabled by highly reliable fiber rich networks that are built on our passive optical solutions make a difference. Think about advanced semiconductors, which are increasingly fabricated using EUV that's enabled by our fused silica. And of course, there's Gorilla Glass and the components we make for the smart devices themselves. Um, I think that it's a big trend for us. As the world continues to pull for digital and automated, it naturally wants more advanced smart devices, quicker connections, and that in turn drives bandwidth and demand for our products, so all good things. And at the same time, uh, you see innovations happening in, in mixed reality, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality devices, and we're working with a number of players in the ecosystem to innovate around uh, not only the connections that you need to make them effective and user-friendly, but also the basic capabilities of the devices. Okay, great. Maybe we could dig down a little into the optical communications takes uh, for, for this for Corning. Yeah, for optical communications overall, I think it's useful to set up a long-term vision. And our long-term vision is that ultimately we'll have effectively unlimited bandwidth and ubiquitous connectivity. How do we get there? Well, I think there are a lot of components and products and services along the way, 
but most of them rely on the capabilities where we're really good, optical physics, glass science, the manufacturing capabilities that provide the processes necessary to deliver the required components. So it's a big deal for us to work closely with innovators in the area um, and various stakeholders from municipalities to national governments to identify bottlenecks, to identify where our capabilities bring to benefit and then focus our resources there. Right now, when we ask the questions, it's really about looking at applications that are either almost ready to go or have just crossed the transition where what we call the E to O divide, uh, where you kind of reach a bandwidth intensity around 100 gigabit meters per second, um, and then finding the right partners to be catalyzing customers in those areas. For now, we think those are in 5G, fiber to the home, and hyperscale data centers. Okay, Jeff, and building on this, as chief strategy officer, you have a lot to manage given the different core competencies around glass, optics, and ceramics, uh, and all the varied end markets. So can you discuss a little bit how you steer the strategy with all those things at play? Right, uh, you know, I think it's an existential reality in technology that whatever technology you're working on, whatever business you're in, it reaches limits, it eventually ends. If you wanna build a company that succeeds over the long term, what do you do with the, as that happens? And I think a lot of companies have very successfully transitioned into services. That's not the answer that we're pursuing. We wanna stay focused on inventing, making, and selling products based on uh, our core materials expertise. So how do we configure the company to do that? I think there are really three parts. The first is be world leaders in capabilities that matter. For us, those are the three core technologies and four proprietary manufacturing and engineering platforms. Second, we want to build strong and deep trust-based relationships with leading innovators, particularly in the verticals we're targeting. And then third, we want to build a company that is great at developing insights and pivoting toward the biggest opportunities. Uh, overall, as the company, given our, our three and four, uh, we are focused on five verticals. Uh, these constitute the Marcus Access platforms or maps that we organize ourselves around to develop the insights that we need to succeed over the long term. Our goal is really to put us at the center of big industry transitions and position ourselves to innovate in materials and processes that are vital to making progress in the world and integral to making it happen. Maybe Claudio, we'll, we'll go over to you for a little bit. Uh, I did spend some time in the optical world before I started my Wall Street career. I know a lot has changed. So as CTO of Optical Communications, maybe give us uh, your view of kind of how you view fiber developing over the next decade. It's obviously gonna be very important for Corning and for society. So maybe if you can give us kind of your views there. Sure, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, I would say that uh, today, I think that probably 100% of the information that we consume every day at some point already went through uh, an optical network in the journey from the source all the way to our uh, eyes and ears. So there are pieces of the network that are still fully dependent on the optical uh, communications. Um, now what we are seeing is that that optical signal is propagating deeper and deeper and deeper into the network. So as Jeff talked about the bandwidth intensity, right? You multiply the distance by the data rate and when that product crosses about 100 gigabit meters per second, that's when we see that uh, it becomes more cost effective to do that in the optical domain. So it's a combination of physics and, and economics there. And of course, the long distance spaces, right? Submarine, long haul, already cross that because it's very long distance. And what we see is that the, the shorter distance spaces, uh, access networks and inside data centers, because the data rates are going up and up, it's crossing that now. So every time we cross that, again, Jeff just explained, we see bottlenecks and, and then that's where innovation ne needs to come. So today we see in access networks, for instance, uh, fiber getting deeper, getting to the, the capillary side of the network, like in our circulatory system, right? So it's an area where you have a much higher volume uh, of uh, points in, uh, as they said, in terms of ubiquitous connectivity, you have to bring fiber into many more different points. It's not only about more fiber for more bandwidth, but it's also more fiber to more 
connections. And it's not only connections to a building or to a home. It can be a connection to an antenna for 5G. It can be a connection uh, to an IoT kiosk. Uh, so that is one thing that is happening. If you look at the other uh, edge of the network, when you get into data centers, um, that's where we see the same thing happening. Uh, I think between switches, uh, most of it was already in the optical, using, in, using fiber. Now we see that propagating even beyond switches to switches, getting close to servers. There are uh, projects on fiber to the server, and, and even get inside the boxes. So you think about the optical signal now going on, we call onboard optics, getting inside of the switches, and perhaps even co-package optics, where, where you get the signal going right there, very close to a switch ASIC. Um, the, the, the switch ASICs right now are getting to uh, 50 or even 100 terabits per second I.O. capacity. Uh, you can't afford having all that bandwidth going through copper, even if it's very short um, or met metallic uh, lines. So that's why you need to bring the fiber very close to that. This is bringing new opportunities, new challenges, but also new opportunities, including, for instance, you know, using glass as an interposer for the optical switches. I think the, the interesting thing is that the fact that we, the optical communication sector of Corning, we are a communications uh, company inside the material science company, uh, it, it brings us a, a, a differentiation that is pretty unique when we are working with innovation. We are probably the only company that, uh, when you think about the communication system, we go all the way from you know, inventing the formulation of the glass that we're going to make the fiber, and then we make the fiber. Then actually the formulation of the organic material that you use as coating, it's ours. Then you put that in a cable, that's our design with our materials. Then you put connectors, that's our design with our materials. Then you put that into a system, into a rack in a data center, you go all the way to wireless for enterprise that we have that. And we see now with this um, convergence between wireline and wireless, uh, edge compute with 5G, all those things are bringing a lot of opportunities where those bottlenecks are showing up and where we, we are pretty excited about leveraging some of our capabilities to go after them. Okay. Claudio, I want to tell you one thing. Sure. When uh, California was the first state to uh, shelter people in home uh, in March of 2020, and I saw the students staying home, people staying home and working from home, and all those Zoom meetings and WebEx and Google Meet and Microsoft Teams and Blue Jeans. I thought of you because I said, Internet, don't, 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 fall. don't <laughs> fail, please. And it survived, very impressive. So I said, kudos to those people who build the Internet. Who is managing the Internet? I hope it will never fail. And it didn't. But you correctly pointed out to me that not everybody in the world joined the internet. There's a couple of billions, there are still five other billions who didn't. And also we used all the buffers available for the internet. So uh, thinking about that, it's actually an opportunity for us at Corning, but hopefully will not face this pandemic again and, and we have you, to worry. You, you're right and actually now that you know a year the pandemic was passed so there are lots of data available for that and we saw that well bandwidth was growing in a you know 30 percent ish every year and we saw that in March 2020 I think at the beginning of the pandemic there was a 25 percent step up mm. on bandwidth and then after that it continued the same about 30 percent growth. So I think what happened is that the network uh, took advantage or leveraged some of the peak to average buffer that they had there, right? And they got very close to, uh, to, to where they could. So it's great that the network was able to, to handle uh, what we went through. But I think that's also why most of the carriers now are thinking, okay, we need more because <laughs> people are, are, are living in a different way. And, and more people coming onto the network, that there are a lot of people who don't have great network access, who hopefully will in the future. You see more and more devices having internet connectivity, cars with 5G modems. Um, so there are many new sources of traffic to go onto the network in addition to yeah. the applications yeah. that people already on the network use more frequently and in more places. Yeah. More places to connect. Now will that, will that fiber start getting tested? Are there challenges for you in the fiber business to further advance the, the technology uh, to, well, to handle all this? <clears throat> I think that um, when you think about communications in, in general, right, uh, there are challenges right now. And in, in if you start from, again, from the core of the network in data centers, for instance, energy is the biggest challenge right now, right? Energy and power consumption inside data center is a big deal. So the entire industry has to work on that. So it's not only about the companies that are making servers or, or switches. 
But you're going to see there a lot of effort going to uh, integration between photonics and electronics. That intercorrelation there needs to be more, more lean and, and provide, you, you need the less picojoules of energy per bit, basically. You have to reduce that. You're going to reduce that uh, miniaturizing uh, 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 components, uh, leveraging some new technology that we are working to when you think about uh, nanotechnology, uh, meta surfaces. So there are some new devices that will come out of that because then you reduce the size, uh, you integrate photonics and electronics, and th that's how you reduce the energy per bit uh, to transmit. Uh, if you go more into the optical side, I think that um, photon management, what we call, which is a combination of guiding and coupling, how can I get the photons in and out the fiber, and how can I make sure that they stay there with the minimal possible loss? This is going to be critical when you get into quantum communication and other things like that. But also, as you try to connect those new devices, those more smaller and more energy efficient desi uh, designs, uh, devices uh, to, uh, to the network. So there is a lot of, uh, it's interesting because it's a moment where we are seeing a lot of opportunities for innovation on products. Uh, on devices, but also a lot of fundamental research going on, right? We are dealing with energy limitations now. We are dealing with things that are extremely fundamental. I, and again, that's a piece that I feel great to be working for a company like, like Corny because fundamental research is, is going to be essential for that. Uh, not all companies have the guts to actually invest in fundamental research, and we do. And I think that is going to come and help us significantly in this new phase that we're going to face. And these research efforts are helping us deliver products right now. So a few weeks ago, we introduced a new optical fiber that is designed for the final connection uh, to a home or to a building. The idea is that we not only make it uh, more bend tolerant, but we also make it more compatible with the existing fibers in the network, how we get photons on and off that fiber so you don't have to do complicated splicing. That takes labor out of the installation, makes it cheaper for our customers, but there are a lot of opportunities along these lines, and you'll see more products for us in the, in the not-so-distant future to do this. Actually, this, this, it's a great example. Uh, density optical density networks translates into many different things, right? More fiber connecting 5D antennas, et cetera, but also go to the core in terms of more dense inside cables. Today there is a challenge between campus and data centers where you have a limited number of ducts and you have to put more fibers there. So we actually need to put more fibers inside the cables. We are going to, you know, several thousand fibers inside a single cable for those connectivities. And the fiber that was just launched that uh, Jeff mentioned allows you to do that. You can put more fibers inside the same cable and make the cable still bendable and so forth. So that optical density uh, is driving some of those uh, new innovations too. Uh, just, just to amplify on Claudio's and, and Jeff's points, and as a researcher looking at the long term, and living in Silicon Valley, it's one of the most important things to realize is the science and technology community in Corning. That's where research and development happens. And add to that the fact that the, the senior management has the patience to wait for the research to see the results. Without that, we'll not have the amazing innovation engine that we have here. So just to amplify this point, it's just, it takes some patience, but the dividends that they pay in the future is just amazing. Yeah, okay, that's great. And I think, you know, Corning, thinking back to my time on the cell side when I covered Corning, I think Corning has always had that patience. I think that what's different about it now is that we've focused around a set of capabilities and markets where we can constantly reuse and reapply. So Claudio was talking about using flat glass as an internet interconnect to take photons closer to the chips in a high performance server or networking device. The starting point is our flat glass that we innovated around the process first for display where we're make, using fusion to make uh, a glass that's chemically optimized, that has incredibly precise surfaces without polishing. Then we took the optics of that to work on things like uh, the backlight for displays. And when we're doing that, we're also learning to write structures and waveguides in the flat glass itself. 
those, that work helps us in display. The work in display helps us with a new set of opportunities in optical communications. The work on ultra low loss fiber sets us up to do quantum communications and people are setting records on it. So it lets us exhibit our patients, which is the heritage of Corning, that things take a long time to play out, but develop intellectual property and capabilities that can help us in the here and now. And I think that makes us much more capital efficient over time. And they take the thin glass, put some accurate holes in it, and use it, as you mentioned, as an interposer for packaging of very high performance IC chips. It's just amazing that we, some, some had the vision to find that application. So hopefully in the future that will, will find use. Jeff, uh, we'll go back to you. Uh, we hear a lot about quantum communications. Yep. I'm curious what your views are there and how Corning's gonna uh, participate in that over the next decade or so. Sure, uh, maybe two separate sets of comments around that. One is, uh, you know, we're really excited that Toshiba set a new quantum communications record on our optical fiber. You may have seen the announcement uh, recently. Uh, but I think quantum communications for us could be a big opportunity in the future, but right now it's a great example of our repurpose and reuse strategy. The idea is that we are repurposing and reusing our capabilities and intellectual property around ultra low loss fiber to secure a seat at the table. Uh, we're supplying uh, components to multiple quantum computing players. We are also uh, working in quantum communications with equipment players like Toshiba, as well as some of our large carrier customers. And as we work with them, we're able to learn a lot about the needs uh, that are happening in quantum technologies and we are able to advance our own capabilities in ultra low loss fiber that we are, is an attractive product for us uh, today. So it's a win-win. We're creating uh, some pretty low cost options for the future. And I think that's one illustration of why the repurpose and reuse strategy is so valuable for our customers. But another way, so if I use that as an example, um, I'll go back to what Claudio was talking about in data centers as we try to take optics inside the boxes. One option for doing that is to use pristine flat glass that's been optically optimized for transition. And our display glass has some really interesting properties with respect to that. So we can bring uniquely the capabilities that we have in the glass science of displays, our optical physics and transmission capabilities from optical communications, and bring novel uh, products to bear. So quantum communications, moving optics inside the box are two really exciting things for us longer term. Okay, love your perspective on this as well. Yeah, I see uh, governments and companies pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into research for uh, quantum technology, computing, communications, and sensors. And uh, uh, just looking at one example, what, what Google showed in 2019 when with 53 qubit computer, they were able to solve a very difficult problem that took them about two days and they said, they claimed that it would have taken 10,000 years on a classical computer, the one we, the state of the art today. Uh, and, and imagine what would happen if they have a, a million qubits, so almost error-free computer. Um, the, the, the other thing is quantum communications, as, uh, as Jeff mentioned. And when you look at those quantum technology, you see people are either using microwave, superconducting technology, or all optical. And in both cases, actually, they need a very, very high speed connections. You can imagine a big room full of equipment just to build the microwave quantum computers. And hopefully in the future that will shrink. So optics is very promising, not just the fiber, but optical components that we are working on. So the way I see it, whenever it will happen, it's just going to be more corning inside. Right. Just a, well, yeah, yeah, one, sure. one comment on that is that it's amazing how those things are connected, right? So the, the understanding that in the near future we're going to have uh, quantum computers, that creates that challenge with, well, maybe classical encryption or classical cryptography is not enough anymore because a quantum computer can, can break that. So that is driving this uh, even a stronger trend for quantum communications. I need to have this secure link. So carriers are thinking about that, not only as, oh, I need that, but also could be a different way to 
bring new revenue sources, right? If I have a secure link, I can have an, another uh, revenue. And that is opening even other spaces when you think about security in general on the network. So it's not only the low attenuation fiber that's specifically for single photon transmission, quantum communication, but also what else can you do to make your network more secure? And there are other technologies that we're playing with to make the, the cables more secure, the optical fiber more secure, sensors along links, etc. So the security of the network is another piece, totally connected with quantum, but can have some other ramifications in new technologies and new products. Great, great, thanks. That's uh, three good perspectives there. Great, now maybe let's talk uh, a little bit of edge compute. We've uh, had a lot of focus uh, on this topic at my firm, and one of the things we learned is there's a lot of different definitions uh, for different people uh, and a lot of dis different aspects to attack this, this area. So maybe, Claudio, if you can start uh, on your side and talk a little bit about how you view edge compute and how the fiber business you think will play into that, and maybe we'll get some other uh, comments. Sure. I think you're absolutely right that uh, there are so many definitions out there, and, and I think it's because of what you said. There are, uh, it's, it's an interesting space where you have several players in the ecosystem all deeply connected to, right? It's not only the carrier networks, it's the hyperscales, the IoT industry, the AI, ML, algorithm uh, folks. So and each one of them look at edge as, uh, from a different perspective, and that's why we get all the definitions. Uh, we, we try to keep it simple here, so I think the way that we look is that edge is a, it's a combination of technologies that uh, leverages this uh, very dense fabric that we have in the network to optimize where the compute will be. Right? So it's, the compute will not be only centralized, will not be only distributed, it's going to be optimized between the edge and the core of the networks. Uh, for what? To, to reduce the cost, of course, there is always, always that, but also to enable some new services, new applications where lower latency is important or where you want to remove part of the compute uh, capabilities of the devices to make the devices cheaper, simpler, smaller, and move that compute capability to the network, to the edge. Right? Now, from an from a infrastructure perspective, we, we are still studying that because things will change. They are being defined as we speak and will change. But one thing that's very interesting to, to keep in mind is that when you look at the cloud and you look at the traffic inside the cloud, it's actually much higher than the traffic in and out. Right? So if you look at hyperscale data centers, the internal traffic is much higher than the, the traffic to clients. Now think about what's happening with Edge. You're getting part of that cloud and you're moving that very close to the client. So you're going to have some of that internal traffic now that's going to be long distance, right? And then you have the Edge to the client. So we think that Edge by itself will reduce some of the long haul cost, but that processing that will have to happen on both sides now may actually increase some of the demand for traffic between those two pieces. Yeah. So that's one of the areas that we're looking. And this, the other one is, of course, when you get from the edge to the customer, now it's when you connect to 5G. Now it's when you try to take advantage, not only the lower latency by having compute closer to the user, but also having a, a, a wireless platform in 5G that also reduces latency. And those things together is what's gonna bring the value, e enable some applications that require that lower latency. A few mentions of 5G in there, maybe we should, should pivot to that. Um, obviously there's, there's gonna be big network changes because of that, so maybe Jeff, if you wanna kick it off on, on 5G and how you see development, obviously there's gonna be a lot more cells out there, a lot more fiber deep, um, maybe talk to us about Corning's play there. Yeah, 5G is really a, a performance spec that it talks about latency, it talks about the bandwidth you need, it addresses the density of users in a particular area. And I used users carefully instead of people because it could be a variety of devices from IoT devices to cars that have 5G modems. Uh, we think that the way that's most cost effective to deliver against that performance specification is much higher density of antennas. Uh, the recent auction in the United States for spectrum uh, exceeding $80 billion is an illustration of why it's so important to use that spectrum efficiently. And as you deploy those antennas, we think fiber is the obvious choice to do it. It's a big new opportunity for us. I, I would say 4G and earlier wireless technologies are relatively fiber poor compared to other aspects of the network. On the other hand, 5G is, is very fiber and optics rich. 
Well, Je Jeff said in the beginning, right, that uh, we try to think about our strategy looking to transformations in industries and when we, we start seeing bottlenecks, right, or, or needs that are not. And, and 5G is a very interesting one because if you look, as Jeff said, on 4G, uh, yeah, it was not a very dense optical uh, network to, to provide the connectivity for 4G. You go to 5G, uh, because you have to you have to reuse that spectrum more times and because you have to have less people connected to each antenna you need to have much more antennas and you need to bring uh, optical signal to all those antennas so it's a very clear example of uh, the network trying to eliminate bottlenecks and we trying to focus our efforts to, to those areas so we have been working on solutions to well, if we're gonna have all those antennas there, and if we're gonna have to bring the optical sing signal there, we need to think about lower cost ways to, to, for the products, lower cost to deploy those cables. And also, how can we deploy those cables faster? Because if you think about the amount of antennas and how fast the carriers want to cover an area, uh, you need to find ways to deploy that faster in a, a lower cost. So. Part of our innovation is focused exactly on that. How can we make fiber to be deployed in a, in a, at a lower cost and, of course, uh, faster? Because uh, there's a lot of antennas that we need fiber, and they don't have fiber right now. Yeah, I think one of the benefits of fiber is its ability to help scale, yeah. and it's inherently future-proof. Uh, the fiber doesn't care what signals you send down it as long as you're in the allowed windows, which are, are quite wide. and, and We've done a good job controlling and matching across a variety of fiber uh, types. But I think that one aspect of 5G that not everyone appreciates because it's very different from 4G is that 5G you can crank up over time and how you crank it up is dependent on what spectrum you have and the number of users that you, that you have and what service levels you choose to deliver. So as 5G applications proliferate, it actually creates more use and a dense fiber network allows you to provision for that over time. So we think the build out of the network and the capabilities for 5G is probably quite a long process, but you'll see lots of 5G along the way. Yeah, I did want to, want to follow up on something you said there. Maybe if you guys put your technology hats down for a second and think about the application and the use case side for 5G. So We've gone through these migrations, 2G, 3G, 3G, 4G, and on the technology side, 4G to 5G, you guys have a good handle on that's gonna happen, but how, how do we get the applications and the use cases growing so that there's real consumption and, and how can Corning you know, assist in that, in that migration? I, I can give you an example, right? Uh, we, we are, for instance, one, one of the uh, application where low la lower latency can be very useful in 5G lower latency can be very useful is on private networks, 5G private networks. Uh, one thing that we are doing right now, we are working with some of our customers using our own manufacturing platform. So we have a lot of plants and factories and, and we are using some of our factories as a test bed. How can I change the way that I do manufacturing now, taking advantage of a network that has lower latency, higher bandwidth, capability to connect much more devices? And we, again, working with some of our customers because they have exactly the same question, right? Now that I have this capacity, this capability in my network, how can I find use cases? And, and it's fascinating how when you, when you get some manufacturing engineers and you tell them what the network is capable, how the ideas start flowing. For instance, if you think about using videos, in a much, much more widespread in manufacturing, right? How we can use high-speed videos for prevent preventive maintenance? How can you use high-speed videos for safety? How can you use high-speed videos to actually understand what ha what's happening in your process right now and create that feedback loop that changes your process to avoid to avoid a defect in your product. So we're doing that in our own factories. Uh, again, working with our customers, with all, our own 5G equipment there, testing that. I think the industry will learn more as we go. Uh, it's similar to, I think, what happened uh, at the beginning of Fiber to the Home, when we had exactly the same question. Well, why people need fiber in their home, right? Uh, and actually, they didn't at the very beginning. But once they got it, then you could see all the different applications, and now people are claiming for more and more fiber to the home. I think it will come, uh, and we're going to help uh, uh, looking at ourselves as well in that. And another way that we help is in terms of our contributions to mobile consumer electronics. And I think a big one for 5G 
is materials that can go on the backs of phones to increase the RF transparency and increase the amount of real estate in a mobile device that you can dev devote to antennas. Uh, and I think more antenna real estate is going to be an important aspect of making really high quality 5G devices. I mentioned when uh, one of the metrics of success in Silicon Valley is when you receive a phone call from a scientist or an engineer from another company saying, oh, I love this microwave properties of your glass. I'm going to use it for an, an antenna. That's something, well, we knew a little bit about, but we, we didn't go deep into it, and, and other people are figuring this out. It, what an amazing media that, that have very low losses at speeds and data rates that go up to 100 gigabit per second. And I think this is an important technology. It will find application in the future, whether it's in antennas for cars or for replacement for PC boards, but those are some of the things that we are discovering now for our materials because it's so pure, it's so perfect, and I think we'll see more of that in the future. Exactly, it's another example of the reuse of the core technologies for, and repurposing for right. different applications. Because glass is made of silica, it naturally matches the thermal expansion of what gets printed on top of the glass for electronic circuits. Right. Um, maybe just to stick on fiber a little bit, two, two different questions here. One, could you talk a little bit about, there's a lot of push from governments, not just in the U.S., but internationally, about digital divide and, and really getting yeah. rural broadband out there. Uh, it seems to be happening across Europe and, and the emerging markets as well. So how do you see that, that transpiring? And then related to that, when you talk about your actual fiber design and manufacture, how over time are you able to differentiate and maybe take cost out to make some of those uh, more reasonable or easier to install or some of the, some of the things that you're, you're innovating on to, to help proliferate fiber like you talked about it getting much deeper into networks? Yeah, maybe I'll start and I, it appears to me that during the pandemic, a number of people, particularly government leaders, have started to view broadband as a basic human right. That people need to be able to connect to the rest of the world no matter where they are. They need it for education, they need it for communication, they need it for information. And as a result of that, governments in Europe and the United States have started to propose much more aggressive builds to take broadband to rural areas and to underserved communities. Um, we are you know, eager to help. Uh, I think that one of the ways that we can make it more cost effective is to help build networks in our factories that can be snapped together in the field. That's led to pretty dramatic decreases in the cost to pass homes and connect homes in the fiber to the home space. I think that we can scale those capabilities over time. And maybe Claudio has some specifics on types of things we do in our factories that you asked about. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, 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 the key is you want to make something that's very high tech, like an optical fiber, to, to be viewed as something super simple by the customer, right? Some, something that they don't even think that's glass, right? That they, they play with those cables as if they don't even know that there is glass inside. So we have been doing that, again, when we worked on fiber to the home, for instance, what Jeff said, trying to make the, the fiber to be something that is a plug and play system, right? So you tr every, everything that in principle you would do in the field, like, you know, stripping the coating of the fiber, splicing the fiber, all that, and that is high it's highly technical labor that you have to do in the field to install a fiber network. How can we reduce that, that cost or increase the speed of installation? Well, let's bring that to our factory. Let's do that uh, connectorization, that splicing, all that work we do in our factory, and we create custom solutions that you just go and plug and play in the field. By doing that, you increase the quality, right, the reliability of the product. You're doing that inside a protected environment of the factory. Uh, you're doing that in a, in a scale that makes the cost much lower. Uh, and then when you give that to the customer, it's much faster and easier for, the, for them to deploy in, in, in lower cost. We have done that in fiber to the home, and we are migrating that to other spaces now. 
now. For instance, if you think about the big hyperscale data centers, uh, if you imagine their campus, right, with enormous buildings, with lots of racks, with servers there, and a lot of, lot of individual jumpers going, can you design that network in our factory? Can we provide cables and solutions and the wiring of that that's already pre-made for that specific custom? So it's a customization that makes their deployment much simpler, easier. Now, if you translate to the beginning of your question in rural broadband, well, we're going to have to do something similar, right? Because in rural, you're going to have to depend even more on a self-installation, for instance, right? Think about homeowners or farmers that are able to do part of that installation themselves, for instance. How can we enable that, making our products more ready for those type of... Yeah, an example is the fiber we introduced a few weeks ago is yep. much more tolerant to bends. Um, so you don't have to worry, did I bend the fiber too much and things like that. You could easily wrap it around a pencil or maybe even a chopstick and it would be fine. And, and lower attenuation. Um, and lower attenuation. Yeah. And better compatibility with the existing fiber network so we don't need somebody to impedance match. I always believe that really good communication means you should have unlimited bandwidth, almost infinite. And bidirectional, this is very important, symmetrical should get as much upload as download, and very affordable, almost free. And, and the pandemic just taught me that was the largest scale experiment for IoT right. that lasted for a long time. The connection lasted, all those students at home were hours and hours on their laptops and, yeah. and, and gadgets, and, and everybody else, the teachers and, and people at work and families and friends. So. I didn't like the fact that my grandchild will come to my home because I have a better connection and he cannot have that in his home. So it, it, it just emphasized the point that, that Jeff mentioned. It's really a human right. You do everything yeah. now on the internet and, and I still believe infinite bandwidth, bi-directional, almost free. We need to make money, so. Yeah, great, great. I do want to follow up on wrapping the fiber around a chopstick, but I sure. think we'll do that another time. <laughs> um, th th some mention in there about IoT, and, you know, another uh, topic that's been out there for a while is smart cities uh, and IoT. I was with one of my companies last week that provides a lot of video to, to the public safety world, and it's really an area that's growing. So curious on how you think about public but both the smart city aspect and IoT. I think Cisco says something like 30 billion devices in four or five years, so three times the number of people on the planet uh, are, are going to be connected. So how does that, how does that play into, into your, uh, your product portfolio and, and strategy? Well, one way that I wouldn't have thought of uh, before being at Corning is that the size and design of our equipment is a big deal in getting permitting. So the Evolve family that we introduced last year uh, shrinks a lot of the, the products that we invented for fiber to the home. And one of the big reasons to do that is not only to get into tight spaces so that when you're doing a smart city installation, when you're doing a 5G network installation, that it looks good and is perfectly viable over the long term to put our connectors and other products outside the buildings because people don't notice. Um, so that may have been a little bit more prosaic answer yeah. that you were looking yeah. for, but it's really important. Right. Well, in a, in a, it's interesting, right? This question that you just asked connect to the two other questions that you asked before. Because when you think about IoT, uh, you need to have this humongous, or you will have this humongous number of devices, right? Well, to do that, you need to have a, 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 a platform or a network that allows that. 5G came. Right, if 5G allows more devices to be connected, and 5G allows those devices to be connected wireless to that. Well, but there is one more thing. If you're going to have that number of devices, you need those devices to be small and cheap. And that means you have to remove the compute part of those devices. So that brings the edge compute, right? So how you connect that uh, to the edge. So that's why it's the, the moment that we're living is so interesting. There is this combination of technology that are coming and enabling the use cases, the, the different things. Um, in terms of our play there, it's so interesting because you, you're talking about the carriers, you're talking about private enterprises with private networks and the hyperscales. Those are the three areas that we're focused. Those are the three areas that we're talking to the customers and, and 
kind of working with them to understand, okay, where are the bottlenecks here, right? What we need to do. So it, it's a super exciting moment for sure. Yeah, and I'll give, I'll give you another very basic example, is that installations are sometimes slowed down or even precluded because you need to get multiple tradespeople involved in doing the installation. You need the optical technician, maybe you need an electrician. Right. So is there an opportunity to bring the electrical power into the optical fiber and deliver it in a way that an optical technician can do the installation? We think the answer is yes. We're working with some partners on that. But it's another exciting way that we can uh, help smart cities happen. Actually, looking longer range about that, I, I just mentioned that the pandemic showed the largest scale experiment in IoT, or IOET, Internet of Everything. Um, I think it would be more than 30 billion devices connected to the internet in, in a couple of years. Um, and I used to preach the Terra era, that the time when people would be using terabytes of storage, teraflops of computing, and terabits per second of communications. I look today at my phone. It's actually, it has one terabyte of semiconductor memory. Semiconductor, very fast memory. It has more than 10 teraflops, terafloating point operation per second. It has about a gigabit of connection. So I'm counting a new cloud. We need that to be the terabit per second to achieve the tera era. And uh, it, it, it's just mind boggling because we thought of that in 1999, 2000, it's happening today, but it's actually even moving from the tera era, we might be calling the Zeta Society very soon. In, in com computation, look at what's happened to computation, extremely fast supercomputers everywhere now. And uh, I see a cor corning playing there, as Jeff mentioned before, in ways we never expected. Some of those materials will be used in 3D IC stacking of those devices just to achieve the, the high throughput of those devices. Um, I see making the ICs, just extreme UV. You need those very precise lenses. And what's better than the purest of all fused silica material. Um, you come to the communications, we covered communication a lot, but I need the terabit per second to achieve this, please, before I retire. And the, the third thing is you look at storage. Uh, you look at the data sphere, the human accumulated knowledge. It was 60 zeta bytes in 2020. A zeta is one with 21 zeros on the right. And the expectation is that you are going to go to 150 zettabytes. Wow, we are approaching the IOTA bytes. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to do that? And even though we are not playing in that field now, but you talk to the storage companies, and they have a brick wall facing them in the next few years. And the trick will be a novel material that will allow us to store all those bits and bytes that people are generating. There is a recent experiment by Microsoft where they use a piece of glass, three inch by three inch by one inch, to store Superman movie, about 100 gigabytes, just a small amount. Uh, so we need new materials that will allow us to get to that uh, zeta byte. So well, what's better than Corning looking into that yeah. direction? And what Wagi just said about the amount of data, then you have to think about how you're going to actually filter the information off, out of that data. And that's why you need more compute. And that's you have to distribute that compute in the network and get into what you talked about before. Yeah. And you did get an action item there. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. So, <laughs> take, take note. Um, maybe, you know, another topic that's very hot, and we could talk about the connectivity piece of this or the entirety of it, but the auto market. So obviously you guys have yeah. a lot of different things going on in the auto. Uh, but it comes up often as one of the more connected devices over time. So maybe just start off with kind of a, an, an overview of, of where, you, where you're playing in there and how that helps you as we get to this next generation of auto. Yeah, there are multiple trends underway in auto. And I think it's useful just to use the industry term case, connected, autonomous, shared, electrified. I think all of those create opportunities for us. But we're talking a lot about digital transformation and optical communication. So maybe, maybe I'll just stick to the autonomy one mostly for a minute. Um, if you have autonomy, it requires a lot of sensors. Kind of cutting edge cars today that are in production 
are requiring 30 plus sensors. They range from LIDAR to driver monitoring cameras. But what they have in common is all of them need covers and those have to be durable. The transmission has to be optimized for whatever wavelength the sensor is using, which is different for an optical camera than it is for LIDAR, for instance. And that pulls directly on our glass science and our optical physics capabilities. Then, once you have the sensors in place, they generate a ton of data. A LiDAR sensor can generate 40 gigabits per second. So back to Claudio's rule of thumb that we talked about earlier, uh, you're crossing that threshold where optical networking is needed. In fact, IEEE has convened a, a committee to define the networking standards for in-car optical networks. And then once autonomy happens, uh, the passengers, the, the old driver, they need to do something. And chances are they're gonna be using apps and those apps are going to require a lot of communications with the network. So again, a major opportunity for us. And when they use the apps, they want the car to be more like a smartphone. And to make that happen, you need some really specialized glass, and that's what our auto glass solutions is about, delivering a unique glass, a glass of its own for the auto industry. So I think there are tons of opportunities uh, in the auto space and, for us. And obviously the sensors we're talking about here, safety, quality, has to be, you know, has to be number one priority, right? And yes, yeah, yes. absolutely, and, and lifetime. Yeah, I want to invite you all to come to Silicon Valley and witness that revolution. I will drive you on those streets and see this, how, how many cars, experimental cars with all those sliders and sensors going around. They look funny, but eventually they will look nice. Um, but as Jeff mentioned, autonomy, connectivity, electrification, it's just amazing. I think, my personal opinion, the next two decades will be the decades of the automobile. The same way the last two decades were the decades of our cell phones and tablets. It's just a lot of research going there. In Silicon Valley, you have the big 11 auto companies with the research labs just looking at this area, autonomous cars, and what will happen inside those autonomous cars. They will be safer. Computers will think much harder or much faster. And uh, we're talking about tablets on wheels or supercomputer on wheels. So. I think we'll be spending the best time of our day in a car in the future, a safe car you're not driving. You do your, all your communication, entertainment, and just very nice environment. But let's look at some numbers. What, what will that require? The predictions now that every autonomous car, autonomy level four or five, will need four terabytes of data every day, every single day. So if you have a fleet of 100 cars and running eight hours a day, and you just collect 10% of this information, you're talking about 365 petabytes per year. Again, back to my Terra era and the Zeta society. So, and many of those bits will, be, will have to be either on board and, or go to a, a server, and for mission critical applications, they have to be on board. So here's storage, generate the bits, communicate them, how am I going to look at night and, and night vision and, and I can't do any compression so it has to be real time. So it, it's definitely going to be fiber optic inside the car. So I think it's lots of opportunities in the car. When we started talking about uh, TAM of $100 per car for Corning, Wagi actually called me up and complained and he thought it was way Great. too low <laughs> for the opportunities we have. I, so I, I'm glad there are actually two cars now that have more than $100 worth of our content in them. So, so we'll, we'll get a few more there. <laughs> yeah, we'll get a few more there, uh, a few more there over time. I have but, one of them. You know, I, I, I think, I think you're right that we you know, have really big opportunities here. There is one that I, still people are not talking much about, and I, I might be wrong, but I do think that back to the infrastructure, uh, I think we're going to have cities that will have enough connectivity there, and when the cars are within those city limits, they're going to have all the bells and whistles working. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if, if we are thinking enough about connected roads when you get in between cities. And you talk about rural broadband, right? Well, we have the same problem with roads, right? And I don't think people will be uh, uh, happy if uh, you know, half of their bells and wheels in the car stop working when they're in a road without connectivity. So I think there is that aspect that I think will be interesting too, thinking about how to bring connectivity, perhaps specifically to the road, not to the area, but make the, the roads 
uh, with more connectivity because of the cars. So that's, I, I think it's another piece that would be interesting for us. Okay, and maybe one, uh, one other topic here. Um, you guys also uh, have some play in enterprises and uh, I do cover the data center space as well and we still see about half of IT on premise at companies and obviously we know which direction that's gonna be going. So maybe talk a little bit about the transformation towards cloud. It's, it's come up in a few of the answers before, whether it's public, private cloud and kind of what that, what that transformation means and how you, how you view that uh, uh, transpiring over the next multiple years here. I think that, um, there, I think there are several things happening at the same time, right, again. Uh, I think that there is the, the, the privacy discussion, security discussions where some enterprise will prefer to have their in-premise. Uh, I think that um, it's, it, the move to cloud is going to happen, it, it, it is happening. And then, as you said before, edge is kind of creating a, a midpoint between those, those two. I think that's probably the direction that most uh, will go. Um, I think one thing that is changing significantly is that the, the hyperscale data centers, they, they are very different than a typical data center of a few years ago. Uh, the way that they are built, the architecture of those hyperscale data centers is pretty much a supercomputer. So it's not really, you're not storing data there, right? You're processing data. And that's why the traffic inside is so much higher. That's why we saw a significant increase in demand of our products on hyperscales. And why is that? Because if you're doing processing, so you're not connecting a rack of servers to the outside. You're connecting all the servers to pretty much all other servers inside the data center to make that work as a computer. So you need much, much more optical links to create that, that processing uh, capacity there. So in, now that they have that, it's amazing to see the new services that they can provide. Again, you put artificial intelligence, machine learning on that, and it's unbelievable what they can provide to the enterprise. So I think that movement to more cloud leveraging edge for the low latent services uh, is gonna happen. It makes sense, enables new revenue opportunities and it's lower cost overall. So I think we're gonna go there for sure. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. I, hyperscale data center is really a supercomputer, electronically processing things and photonically interconnected. That's the best description of, of, of a hyperscale data center. They are here to stay. I think the edge will complement that, but those big, huge data centers, a lot of money was invested in it. They work very well, and it's a very good opportunity for Corning, as Claudio mentioned. Just add more interconnects inside the, inside the data center, inside the supercomputer. Right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and thank you, Claudio, Jeff, and Wagi, a uh, lot to think about today, a lot of great information that we got from you guys, so appreciate that. Jeff, if you'd like to maybe give us a closing comment here. So to, to wrap up for me, uh, we started the conversation about how do you think about Corning's strategy as a company that participates in multiple industries, and I talked about the idea is to be good at seven things and figure out how to apply those to opportunities and make yourself vital to moving the world forward. And stepping back from this conversation, I think you heard about digital transformation, you heard about new paradigms in computing, about autonomy, AR, VR, ways that glass can help extend Moore's law by making big rooms into supercomputers or being interposers between the layers of advanced semiconductors and contribute to EUV. So it makes me really feel good as a chief strategy officer that we have lots to do in the coming decades. Great, awesome.